Welcome to CXO Talk, episode number 784. We're discussing data and analytics strategy with Bruno Aziza, the head of data and analytics for Google Cloud. I've been in the data space for over 25 years now. There's probably three key main themes that just continue to come back to conversations with uh, customers. The first one is this idea of convergence, the so convergence of data and convergence of workloads. You know, organizations are you know, challenged with this idea of having siloed teams and siloed data. So they want to be able to bring all of that into a unified kind of workflow. And so think about uh, SQL, uh, think about Spark, think about machine learning and BI and AI. Organizations are trying to kind of figure out ways to get these uh, techniques and data silos, but more importantly, people silos to converge because they're realizing that the way to get to value is to get more people to collaborate more effectively. So definitely this idea of convergence is a very real one. You might have heard the uh, lake house concept, but the whole idea here is, is how do I bring people and data together? So that's the first trend. The second one, which people I think are realizing now, particularly as they're modernizing to the cloud is the concept of governance, not as just a way to secure or protect access, but as a way to have better trust in your data. And so I call this governance with a big G because it talks about, of course, all the basic stuff that you need to do, security access, but also lineage, quality, be able to discover uh, metadata effectively. And so and that's really important because today, bad data costs the average organization a lot of money. I think there was research from Gartner that showed it was at least 12 million uh, per year. And then the third one is around activation. You know, it's great to have access to all the data and see all the data. It's really essential to be able to trust it. And now you need to be able to empower people to take action to it. So what we're seeing is people are moving beyond dashboards into what they start to call data products, where they want the ability for their folks to get access to analytics and the workflow in real time without having to pay for the what I call the data logistics, the, the work that you have to do to move the data across multiple places before it can be acted upon. So the concept of real time is an important one when you think about data products. This concept of data products is becoming increasingly important, but I think it's a little bit confusing to people. Can you tell us when you when we talk about a data product, what, it, what does that refer to? What is a data product, right? Because we run into the semantics of defining how do you think about a data product? So think about it from your perspective as a consumer of information today. You know, I, I'm sure you listen to a lot of music. If, if you use Spotify today, for instance, that's a, a great example of a data product. And why is that? Is because it's a consumer grade experience that is backed up by an enterprise grade infrastructure, right? You, you don't want uh, Spotify to break on you because it's a very frustrating experience. If it does, you can't find the song or the song doesn't play in time and so forth. So that's a requirement. Customer grade experience, very useful, very usable, requires very little training, while at the same time, considering the concept of data that's being pushed into the application as a business critical um, concept. The second attribute of a data product is that it's a real time product, right? And in the past, uh, you know, if you've been in the data business, you've been in the data logistics business where you basically take data out of a source, uh, maybe put it into a data mart or an extract, and then build a visual, typically a dashboard that enables people to ask a certain set of defined, predefined questions, right? A lot of the work that's happened in this industry has been about us, the data people, preconditioning, massaging the data, presenting it so people can ask a set of few questions. The products concept is about removing this idea of data extract. So you're now asking questions to the data in real time, straight into the origination. And you're also opening the ability for people to ask just about any question. You know, what we're discovering is for every single question the business users has, there's another six question they have after that. And so one of the issues that dashboards typically have is that they're static and they've been preconditioned to answer only a set of questions. And so it creates also a lot of frustration for users, uh, which doesn't work in 2023. Um, you know, another great example of, uh, of a data product is google.com. Why does it work? Requires no training, a very simple interface, 
handles limitless amount of data of just about any format, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, and gives you an incredibly personalized experience at an incredible scale, right? Because billions of people use that product. So when you're thinking about this mindset, designing data products is drastically different from building the data warehousing and the dashboards that we used to build, you know, uh, I want to say 10 years ago, but in fact, you know, we're in the middle of this shift here. So I would even say three years ago. Then to paraphrase what you just said, the data product extends from what the user experiences. So it's the, the combination of the underlying data, consumer fr friendly, potentially real time, wrapped up in an attractive user experience and backed up with the technology infrastructure to deliver that data as just described with that type of user experience. That's right. I think, you know, there's three concepts here, right? There's the data itself. So it needs to be just about any data structured and structured, semi-structured. It doesn't really matter. It needs to be data that's across just about any cloud on premise and in the cloud. That's notion one, data. Time is the second notion, this idea of it needs to be real time to be useful. And then people, just like you uh, noted, you know, your, your employees, your stakeholders are consumers first. And so they expect their data applications to mirror the consumer experience that they have on their phone. And so if, if you're very far from that, it just becomes really hard for them to adopt them. And certainly being available at scale, we know today that you know, the dashboards of the past or even the dashboards of today are typically only adopted by 30% of your employees. So you can imagine 70%, seven out of the 10 people that you've built this dashboard for will not look at it. And the consequence is they might be great insights, but they won't be able to act on them because they don't find the experience uh, enriching, trustable, or even relevant or timely please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter and you can stay up to date with our upcoming shows. We have a really interesting question from Twitter, from Arsalan Khan. And this is a great question. And he says, wouldn't asking questions of the data be dependent upon how much the user knows about the limits of the data. And so, so therefore, don't you need enterprise education around the data? Unfortunately, the technology up until now, I think, has limited our ability to create innovation uh, across most organizations. So I'll give you a very specific example I think addresses the question is, if you think about machine learning today and innovating with machine learning, it's a very expensive process. It requires dedicated talent, very specific understanding, uh, and it also requires time uh, that is needs to be de dedicated to assign a specific innovation to a specific talent. What we are noticing is, in fact, when you now open up technology to many people, you actually discover that many of your business users have great questions and we've limited the ability to answer these questions because of the technology limitation uh, i think the answer of the future is is kind of what voltaire used to say right that I'm, I'm french as you might know and i'm a big fan of french philosophy and voltaire used to say judge the the a person by the quality of their questions not necessarily the quality of their answers and i think by opening access, opening the ability to kind of fail and experiment at a very low cost, you'll be able to identify those really, really good questions that business people should be asking. Uh, and they have the ideas. And so somehow we need to figure out a way to unlock that. I think that if you're just keeping it to the people that know the limitation, that know the technology, that have the specialized skill, uh, you have fewer innovations. And the ones that you're uh, are pursuing might not be the right ones and they're expensive to pursue as well. You know, today, I think the stat in the market is 20% of the machine learning models actually make it to production. So you can imagine you've reduced the number of questions to just a few people. And even those, 80% of them just never make it to realization. It's a, it's a real uh, issue, I think, in today's market where data should be a lot more available and innovation should be a lot easier than it is today.
Can you give us some concrete examples of data products in the enterprise and how that's distinguished from dashboards? We all know what dashboards are, but but the, still, for me, the concept of the data product it's it's still kind of abstract. Yeah, let me give you a specific example you might relate to in the uh, in the retail business or in the uh, you know the the CPG uh, industry. So L'Oreal, again, I'm sorry I'm picking on the French company, but that's uh, just one example that came to mind. L'Oreal was realizing that they needed to have a better relationship with their customers, a more frequent relationship, so they can you know understand their preferences better and build better products. Now, the way that they would interact with customers, you know, in major part, people would go to their website, but they would really have a strong relationship by people going to their stores, go to their stores, visit the stores, talk to an advisor, understand your preference and so forth. Um, they built an application called Motiface, which is essentially an application you get from your phone where you can point it at your face and it suggests maybe products that are relevant to what you're wearing, uh, maybe you you advise you ask for advice on here's what I'm doing tonight or here's what I'm doing today. So it creates makeup options for you. It creates all these options that are related to L'Oreal's products. By having this really tight relationship with the customers, where they went from four hours a year by people visiting their stores to now having a daily conversation with their customers, they saw a, a much higher level of conversion, 42% conversion between their marketing campaigns and people actually buying products. They even further extended with that knowledge, enabling their uh, infrastructure, their physical infrastructure to enable customers to build their own makeup. So you can, using Motiface, Michael, you can go and build your own lipstick if you want. That is just the one lipstick that you've created yourself. And so, that I think takes the idea of an excellent customer experience because we know each other a lot better. And if that's your goal, then you can't achieve it by just waiting for your customers to visit your store. And so similar examples will exist in banking. You know, retail is not the only one, but you can imagine kind of the extension of uh, data products and what data products would actually provide, both for the provider of the service, but also for those customers that are having a fast superior experience, all of that done through data. So there's this highly interactive aspect that's really tailored to what the customer is trying to accomplish very directly at that moment. That's right. And I think the character of personalization at scale is really important because I think it, 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 it demonstrates that you as a provider of a service or product, you are really on the same page as your customer, you really understand them. You know, if you think about why do people go to their bank or or their grocery stores or so, you know, they're not just there to buy a specific product, particular service. They, you know, the next level experience is they're there because we connect at the experience level. We we know what you want. We know you. We can make your experience frictionless, and we can customize it for you. You know, you think about. Starbucks wants it's a great example of mass customization. You know, you're you're creating your own coffee. And so the same concept here happens, which, you know, can your technology stack support this, these types of experiences in, in, in a modern world where your customers are expecting that now? Can you describe differences between the infrastructure necessary for traditional dashboards versus what's required to be in place in order to create this type of data product? There's a few components that are required and, and you know, typically people refer to it as the modern data stack. Uh, uh, what's required in order to uh, work through a, a scenario like this where the real-time nature of the information is, is paramount to the, to the experience. So I think the first, I'm gonna use a few verbs here because I don't wanna talk about just purely the technology, but the verbs is I think what's probably most important you know, I'm a big fan of the theory of jobs to be done. I don't know if you know this book, Michael, Competing Against a Luck by Clayton Christensen. It's a, a really good way to think about how people consume innovation and, you know, realizing that, you know, as a customer, you're hiring someone to solve a particular job. And so these verbs I'm using are there to define what these jobs are. So the first one is about 
being able to ingest and process data uh, of any type and being able to ingest it at any speed. So being able to ingest it in batch when it's relevant, but most of the time using the same technology stack, being able to ingest this in real time. So the, the real time nature of the ingestion, the transformation is extremely important. The second verb is about uh, storing and analyzing, right? So of course you need to be able to store your data, any data in about just the same infrastructure uh, typically, most organizations today will have a data warehouse and they'll have a data lake and they'll have data marts and they'll have dedicated you know, places where they store data of, in, of different types and typically of different use cases. Typically, we tend to think that a data lake is better uh, for a data scientist that want to work with unstructured data. Well, a data warehouse might be better for business analyst that wants to use you know, structured data. Uh, information. What we're seeing is the convergence of these concepts into one big area, if you will, one big data ecosystem or a state that typically is referred to as the data ocean. Why the ocean is because you want to build an infrastructure that allows you to see no end to your data. And actually, a customer of mine um, taught me this concept. I was asking him why was he not talking about data lakes, and he told me that the lake is, is comfortable, it's landlocked. I see the end of my data. The ocean is very representative of what I'm dealing with on a daily basis. I've got data across my estate. Sometimes I need data sharing platforms because I've got data from my providers. Uh, sometimes I get data in another cloud. And sometimes I've got structured and structured data that I need to analyze together. And so the ability to treat data of different types, of different sources, uh, in the same platform is really important, not just for the technology itself, but also for the teams themselves. Right today, you know, innovating with machine learning typically requires that you move data to a different place, that you require a different team than your business analyst to work on it, and that's where collaboration breaks. So you want to converge people into the same type of tool set um, and the same ability to work on any data from the one place. And then the final one is the integration around you know, an API first uh, structure for building these data products. You know, the big, big difference uh, between a dashboard and a data product, the data product is API first. And the reason for why it matters to be API first is because you're going to want to ping external systems in real time through APIs, and you want to gonna drive actions into other systems through an API, which you can't do in the old world of data extracts, static reports, filtering that maybe require action through a meeting or action through an email, which you know that's really uh, kind of the old way of, of doing business. Now, everything's API first and everything is ingested through an API and everything's acted through uh, an API. So those, those three kind of areas, right? So, uh, you know, store, so ingesting, transforming, storing, analyzing, and then activating, are probably the the jobs, if you will, the verbs that I would use to describe what your modern data stack should look like. We have a couple of uh, really interesting questions from Twitter. Elizabeth Shaw wants to know what is meant by applying a product approach to data, and what does that look like from a data scientist perspective? You know, it's not just about the technology, but it's also the team. You know, what we've discovered is that while, you know, there's an incredible amount of technology that's available for you as a data team leader to innovate, you also need to adapt your structure to this new challenge, right? In the past, we were in the business of protecting data and making sure that only the data that was sanctioned could be used by only a few people. And that was a cost conversation. You know, you had capacity-based, you know, systems, and you could budget that. Now you've got this relationship with data that's just a lim limitless amount of data, limitless amount of people. So how do you organize yourself around that? What we found is the teams that succeed the best, and, and particularly when you talk about data science, typically have five key roles that they organize themselves around. The first one is the data product manager. So just like it is in any software development you know, organization, you have someone whose job it is to say, here's what the final product is. And I own the result of that from the origination of the data all the way to the consumption of that data itself. And the data product manager tends to be the right role 
that people hire. The second one is the program manager. The program manager is the person that's going to partner with their uh, product manager, and they're going to make sure that everything happens on time and per the requirements that were written by the product manager. Typically, the product manager might use a product requirement document or PRD to define what their product should be. The third role is a UX leader. So we always think about you know, as, as being very logical. And you know, if you're a data scientist yourself or business analyst, you imagine that your stakeholders will react the same way to the applications you're using. But what we're realizing is that's actually not the case. A big reason for why they're not adopting our applications because the UX or the UI needs to look a little different. And so we always think, you know, the best UI is no UI. So think about how can you make it easy for people to consume uh, the application. Then the fourth role is the data engineer and the data scientist. You know, they tend to work and design and build and deploy the infrastructure, but also the applications uh, around you know, all the verbs that I talked about, around data, storing, analyzing, processing, and so forth. And their job is really about how do we make it possible to activate these products at scale? And then finally, the chief data officer, the, you know, the great news here, um, if you're working at a data organization today, Elizabeth, you know, I, I hope that there is a chief data officer where you work because now 83% of organizations have chief data officers. 10 years ago, only 10% or 12% of organizations had chief data officers. So there's great news for us here because that means that part of your team is someone in the executive suite who is reinforcing this need of this is how we act today. This is why data is now becoming a, an incredible asset for saving money and making money for the organization. So I, I know, Michael, I might have over answered the question here, but I thought it was very relevant for how you think about data science and the other roles involved in the data team. Absolutely. You're pointing out an extremely crucial aspect of this, which is data science does not exist as a, as a abstract concept. It's not a platonic concept. It needs to be actually executed with people, by people. And it does not exist just in isolation to the rest of the team. I think that's that's really what sometimes makes the data scientists lonely is that they feel like they're just the only one pushing for this agenda. So really look to you know, be included in, in a larger team uh, across these roles that I talked about here. And I'm just tweeting out, Data scientists are sometimes lonely. <laughs> it's a it's a difficult profession, you know. It's a because I think you know one of the issues that we deal with is people don't understand how hard of a job working with data can be. And so, if you're a data scientist, you're highly qualified. You almost sometimes have this curse of knowledge where you know how hard it can be, but then you might have business users that have expectations of delivery that are you know in the time frame that maybe your current stack can't uh, allow you to deliver so you really need to modernize your stack modernize your team so you can you know develop solutions at the speed of the business we have a couple of more questions coming in i'm just going to take these in order arslan khan comes back again with another really really good question he says that to it seems that to accomplish the things you're describing require a lot of resources. Small organizations don't have those resources. So is this becoming a kind of have and have not situation of data? This might have been true, uh, this assumption of working with data at scale in the old days where you, you did have to buy very expensive on-premise systems and you needed people to support them as well. So it wasn't just that you needed to spend a lot of money in software itself, but you also needed to spend a lot of money in the team supporting that software or that hardware in the on-premise world. I think that was very true. I think what we have noticed over the last 10 years is really uh, a complete shift where now you can get access to incredible amount of compute, incredible amount of storage for pennies, and you can get it done in the next five minutes. You know, I'll just, you have an example of BigQuery as a sandbox. You don't even need a credit card to start working with a data warehousing uh, solution at scale, hosted in the cloud, managed for you. So one person in five minutes can do something that maybe 10 years ago would require a team of 10 people 
and a procurement process that could take six months. And so this ability to technology uh, is really been incredible in the last 10 years. Uh, similarly, machine learning now is more accessible than uh, it has ever been. You know, if I look at products like BigQuery machine learning, for instance, that is a SQL way to interface with machine learning models, that was never done before. So in terms of the ability to hire someone that can write machine learning models, you know, that's a process by itself. It is so much available today that I think it's also changed the way we, as data people, we need to think about what we're building. You know, in the past, when capacity was not available, it would take a long time to procure, and it'd take a lot of money to build a team and buy the software required. The questions that we would ask is, you know, can we build this? So you have an idea and you say, can we actually effectively do this? Today, I think the question is, should you do it? Because so much technology is available that now you've got a lot of, of solutions that are built where they're built because you can. And so it requires a different mindset, I think, for a lot of teams today that is a completely different one um, than it was maybe 10 years ago. But the good news here is because you can essentially build anything today, the cost of experimentation just goes down to a ridiculously low cost. So now more ideas can be seen. It is amazing the power of the cloud to provide these kinds of resources to anybody at extremely low cost and, and immediately as well. That's right. Incredible. I have another really interesting question. You can, you can see I love taking questions from Twitter and from LinkedIn. The audit, you guys in the audience are so smart, so intelligent. It's awesome. And this is from Chris Peterson, and his Twitter name is Chris is also on Mastodon. So, OK, Chris. And Chris wants to know, would you say that data products are some of the main goals for your customers' digital transformation efforts? Or to ask it another way, what's the intersection between these data products and digital transformation more broadly? I would say that they are tightly related because you know part of your digital transformation is the modernization of your technology stack, but I think probably most importantly, your processes, right? I think what we notice is the companies that tend to just do a lift and shift, meaning take the process that they have and the applications they have on premise and just essentially replicate them uh, in the cloud, I think what they're realizing, there's a, a good amount of you know, missed opportunity if you do it that way. I'll give you an example of a recent customer I was talking to who has thousands of reports on-prem and they're looking to modernize. And the first approach was, you know, there's got to be a reason for why these reports are there. So I'm just going to take every single one and build a project plan that's going to copy what's happening on-prem and then I'm gonna put that in the cloud. And what we looked at when we saw the uh, metrics around these reports is it was a third, a third, a third. And what I mean by that is a third absolutely could be lifted and shifted into the cloud. And it made a lot of sense because they had a lot of users. They were effectively at the core of the business being run by this organization. A third needed to be modernized because they had effective you know, metrics that needed to be seen but they had issues with usability, availability, reliability. So they clearly needed to be you know, modernized, kept and, and modernized, if you will. But there's a good third that nobody cared about. They were the wrong reports. They had the wrong semantics. Nobody used them. Uh, they were essentially not as useful as the other two categories. Those, we never you know, moved them or modernized them. So I think where it's similar is when you think about digitalization, it's not a technology problem. You know, what you're really looking to build is a faster, bigger, stronger organization that is closer to your customers, that has better operational efficiency. And if that's the case, then it does require that you have to think about what we're doing today is not what we're going to want to do tomorrow. Maybe we're solving the same problems, but we're going to solve them differently. So digitalization really is about you know, transformation, not so much just replication. You've emphasized the importance of teams and team collaboration. You described five important roles that a data product team should have in place. 
But can you elaborate on why this concept of collaboration and working together becomes so important with this environment particularly? Often, you know, we get enamored with the incredible amount of innovation being thrown at us. I mean, every week there's new technology being announced that we think is going to change uh, the world. You know, for I was reading research uh, recently for every dollar spent on employees in the technology organization, there's anywhere between 30 cents to 60 cents spent on tools. And so the reason for why employees are extremely important to your technology strategies, you could see from a spending standpoint, they are the majority of the spend. Now, of course, there are some industries that have higher tech spend, right? So for instance, financial services, the technology, the healthcare organizations, we found tend to spend more uh, on tech, whereas retail uh, uh, and e-commerce um, might not. So, you know, it's going to be different in your industry. But the point is, the bigger, the biggest silos that you have in your organizations is actually not the data silo; it's a people silo. Um, and so, being able to figure out how to get teams to collaborate is how you're going to be able to, uh, you know, create more innovation. And where we see it is the places where it does not work is when you have a divided teams around disciplines. So you have your data scientists over here and your business analysts over there, and they're using a different tech stack, they're using different data, they're using different languages, and for them, collaboration is impaired by design. And so really breaking through that is extremely important. And the other reason for why employees is really important is I think in our, in our business, even though we're logical and we think that because we're data people, everything is decided through logics. In fact, that's not how we we make decisions. We're emotional people that make decisions that you know is often justified by data. We're not logical people that are you know uh, you know where the emotions modifies the decision. And so a great example of that is culture affecting a data culture inside an organization. It's the number one issue for an organization to be data driven. You got to think about that. So culture is not what you put on the billboard on the wall. Culture is what you do. And so you have to be able to exemplify. You have to be able to organize your teams in ways that is aligned with your culture and your principles. That's why we spend a lot of time looking at organizational design, because that is ultimately what's going to make the difference. And Arsalan Khan comes back yet again. And just before you mentioned culture, he asks, it's perfect timing. <laughs> he anticipated your comments and he says, okay, Mr. Aziza, what is the ideal data culture and how do you create it? So I don't know that I have, I wish I had the formula for it. Here are the five things you need to do, but I will tell you, you know, what I'm learning from working with uh, customers. I uh, think about Mercado Libre and WPP, Adrian Mercado Libre, or, or uh, Dai um, Mays at the WPP are, are examples to follow on how they built a, an incredible data culture across their organization. So there are a few things that they do, and I could share with you what, they, what they're doing so you can get a sense. The first one is they do have data culture principles. That's a, a required process. You have to go and state, this is how we think about data at this organization. But they don't stop there, right? They of course, they have the posters, but then what they do is they use practices by which they are, you know, the, the employees are exposed to this culture on a daily basis. So there's a few tactics. The first one, the easiest thing that you can do today, and it sounds really uh, simple, t-shirts, hats, mugs, brand your data culture initiative and make sure people use that in their daily meetings. You know, so I had a customer, for instance, that was in the gambling business and they called their uh, culture initiative DICE, D-I-C-E, because people would recognize, oh, DICE, you know, that's what we work with on daily basis. And I asked, what's DICE? And he explained to me, it was Data Integration Center of Excellence. So he came up with an acronym uh, that defines what they're focused on, in this case, data integration, but also is catchy. So that's the first thing. I know it requires for us to be a little bit more creative, but it's it actually makes a big difference. The second one is, they actually hire people to help with data literacy and data enablement. So in the case of Adrian at Mercado Libre, he's hired someone who's been in the training business to come in and enable people on using the solutions to data products that they've built. Of course, 
you know, we're not talking here about people building data products. We're talking about people consuming data products in an effective way in their daily workflow. And so that does require a, a lot of work with the assumption that the people, their shareholders are not expected to be data creators necessarily. You just want to create consumption patterns that are more effective for your organization. And then the third thing that they do is they do uh, what we call decision-making introspection. So often you have a practice of post-mortems. Uh, you know, you go through a process, a decision occurs, it's not yielding the exact results you expected and you want to assess why that happened. A lot of the organizations now that are trying to drive this data culture, this data first culture, they're doing pre-mortems. Before we go out and make a decision, let's get in a room and imagine everything that could go wrong because there's nothing worse than reacting. And so they want to proact basically on something they imagine could go wrong. And you know, these are simple examples that they're not simple to implement, but they're simple tactics that really reinforce this idea of culture is what we do is not what we say. And so how, where do you see those examples throughout your day where you are effectively living your culture? So clearly there is a very strong intention and recognition up front of the importance of culture and therefore it is not left to be, oh, well, it'll just happen or, or it's not left as an afterthought. That's correct. I think the intention and having the chief data officer uh, and the CEO ideally, you know, lead with data and lead and not in a suggestion, not in sponsorship, leading as a mandate and say, and realizing data is the way we get this company to the next level. And this means some habits or new habits are going to show up in ways that maybe we didn't think about before. Where does data quality come into play now with data products? It's probably the most important uh, component, right? Because if you think about why is it that people are not adopting the dashboards of the past, of course, there's usability issues. Of course, there is a timely issue. Of course, there is you know, all the issues related to the, the infrastructure itself, and maybe the, the skill set required to use these dashboards. But the number one reason for why people you know, can't make decisions based on data that's provided to them is because they trust them. They just don't trust the data. And trust is the basis of just anything we do. If you even think about your team, you know, what makes a team perform is the element of trust, is that you can communicate to them that you trust that they will actually achieve the, you know, the opportunity in front of them. It's the same thing for data. So, you know, this is not a new problem. You know, I was um, actually discussing this uh, recently and I, I Googled, you know, the, the principles of data quality. And I found a 1991 paper from MIT. Um, and in fact, the, the author is uh, Richard Wang, who is uh, the person that organizes MIT's CDO symposium where he was listing the 20 attributes of data quality. Now, there are a lot of ways that you can think about uh, data quality, as you can see, but I would say there's probably three things that matter the most. The first one is, what do you know about your data today? Is it complete? Is it fresh? Is it rich? Is it secure? Right. So the richness of the data really enables you to trust it even more. The second item is, how does it relate to your people? Are people able to find this data or the way it's presented to them relevant to them, right? Because there's a, you know, as I said earlier, we're emotional creatures making decisions. We need this to be relevant to us, right? The nirvana of any data is when it tells you something about yourself that maybe you don't know about yourself. So the aspect of being relevant and personal to the person is, is really important. And then the, the third attribute is, is it actually actionable? You know, is it something where I'm telling you, Michael, it rained yesterday, you should have gotten a, an umbrella. Well, that's accurate information. Uh, you've got great action, but there's nothing you can do about it. It rained yesterday. This, you know, So this idea of being timely, understandable, actionable is a key component of how you assess data uh, and how you assess and trust the value of the data that's being provided to you by your organization and your data teams. What advice do you have for organizations who are trying to build a data and analytics strategy in line with the principles you were just describing? The first one is, you know, start with people. Don't necessarily just start with technology. I know that's probably surprising because I work for a technology company. 
But I really do believe that is the way that we are going to be able to help each other innovate. And so this concept of the five roles across your data team is a really critical one. Look at the ratio of data people you have inside an IT or your IT organization. That's a, a really big one when you're thinking about how many people do I need? You know, the average organization has anyone anywhere between two to 6% of their IT group is data people. The most mature organizations have anywhere between 15 to 18% of their IT people are data people. So I would benchmark that. Just look at what does your organization look like? Second, I would look at build for scale today. So many of the organizations I think that are making a mistake with data today is that they might build for small data today saying, you know what? Big data is not relevant to me. You know, I'll worry about this in three years. And unfortunately, what happens is the choices that they make on small data infrastructure do not scale economically and financially for the large data issues that they're having, in fact, a lot earlier than they thought they had. So they're, they're buying into a model that just doesn't really help them to succeed months after they've made the decision. And then the third bit is focus on integration unification, not just of the technology, but the teams. How can you get your teams to collaborate more often? at a higher velocity on more problems. We talked about making machine learning approachable. Please don't just make it a thing that only a few people inside the organization can do. As we see, it doesn't work. 20% of machine learning models make it to production. That's not how we're going to innovate. We got to be able to get more people to ask more questions so we can get to which are the most important questions to solve, the ones that are most valuable, the ones that move the needle the most. Okay, and with that, we have covered a lot of ground today. Uh, a huge thank you to Bruno Aziza. He is the head of data and analytics for Google Cloud, and he runs a great, what he calls a car cast. It's, it's like a video podcast, but from his car. And he always wears sunglasses. There you go. And I have a pair for you as well, Michael, when you become a guest of my podcast. I accept those virtually. Bruno, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk to you. And everybody who watched, thank you for being here, and especially those folks who asked such awesome questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter and you can stay up to date with our upcoming shows. And with that, check out CXOTalk.com for the upcoming schedule and we will talk with you soon. Have a great day, everybody.